All right. Uh, well, welcome. This is uh, chapter nine of the Designing Data Intensive Applications book. Um, this chapter was, well, it was long, but it was also tough for me. Um, I think conceptually it was probably the, the most abstract, um, but we are at the peak of it. So, so chapter nine is the end of, of uh, part two of the book and uh, it's sort of downhill from here. We got three more chapters. We'll talk about batch processing, stream processing, and then he has sort of a summary chapter. So, um, so I don't know how many of you tried to read this chapter in advance, but, um, but if you struggle a little bit like me, then, then uh, you know, I think you're okay. <laughs> um, one comment just for me, uh, for whatever reason, I, had, I flashed memories of uh, back when I was in, in high school, when we first, uh, when I took chemistry, they first taught sort of this, this simplified Bohr model of the, of the atom, you know, and it's just like, you know, you got electrons in circular shells, right? And it solves some of the problems. Like you can actually, uh, you know, predict uh, the different, the different colors of light, you know, the different frequencies from, from electron transitions, but it doesn't solve all the problems. And so ultimately, you know, you need, you need quantum mechanics, right? And so I felt this chapter, I sort of flashed that because it's sort of like, hey, let's talk about this concept, but you know what, it doesn't really work. And then we'll talk about this other concept, which is actually cool, but it doesn't really solve the problem that you need solved for, for, for consensus. Um, and it was sort of like this, a couple of things. So, um, so for whatever it's worth, you know, that was kind of what I felt the ride uh, was like. And, and so um, my notes this week are a little bit higher level. Um, so feel free at any point if you have questions or if you want me to pause, I'm perfectly happy to um, show some of the diagrams, the examples from the book. Um, there, there were good ones in the book, but, um, but trying to walk through and especially because it's like, hey, let's talk about this topic. And then in the end, you're gonna find out that this topic isn't really what you need. So like not, uh, not gonna belabor, you know, all the details for the different examples. So that's sort of just my opening remarks. Um, so consistency and consensus, we've now looked at the different building blocks. We know what the different kinds of distributed systems are. We talked about replication and partitioning. Um, and then basically last week was sort of like, you know, Ryan talked about all the kinds of things that can go wrong. And basically if you dig deep enough, it's, it's, you know, it's somewhat intractable. And so ultimately you do need some abstractions uh, for application developers to be able to build things uh, just to, to take away some of the complexity of the different failure modes. And so this chapter ultimately builds towards consensus, which is necessary to give sort of a, a consistent view of the information to end users. Um, but it's also necessary, excuse me, just for some internal um, operations. So just like leader elections. But we start out with sort of this view of consistency and working our way up. And so the first thing we talk about is consistency guarantees. Um, and so this idea of eventual consistency, when you have nodes that can go down, when you have networks with unbounded latency, it's really difficult to, um, you know, as the author says, it's really difficult to reason about applications. It's hard for you to, to as, as somebody designing a program to say, these are all the possible ways it can fail. It's sort of like there's, there's almost limitless ways and there's race conditions and all sorts of bizarre behavior. Um, and so you can have the, the, the thing that I've talked about, which is very frustrating where, you know, you go and you look and the score is one nothing. And then you look again, you refresh and it goes back to zero, zero. Um, and so it looks like things are going backwards in time. So we've talked about sort of ordering and consistency in sort of a single node perspective. And so now we're gonna look at stronger consistency or guarantees for distributed systems. And the first thing we talk about is linearizability. Uh, this is a concept that's fairly, um, uh, I guess it's fairly, it's sort of like the first thing that you might think about if you're just like, well, how are we going to solve this problem? I don't really want to read from one replica and get, 
you know, a zero, read from another replica, get a one, read from another replica, get a two. How am I supposed to, you know, make sense of all of that? Um, and so the idea of linearizability is that basically it gives you the illusion if you only had um, a single replica, if you only had a single store, then of course, as writes happen over time, it can change, but it'll, it'll always move forward. It won't ever fluctuate back and forth like my example of the, you know, the sports score where it goes one zero and then it goes back to zero zero where you get a stale read. Um, and so the author goes through some different things, but ultimately there's a diagram and, and I can pull it up where it shows that each operation that you perform a read or a write has a window, okay? It has the time when the original request is made and then it has the time when the response. And inside of this window, if you just model it as a single point in time when it actually happened, okay? Um, and it can be anywhere during that window between when you made the request and when you got the response back. So it could be very early, very late in the window. So if you model every read and every write as having a specific point in time, then basically what has to happen is if you, if you line up all the reads and the writes, um, then the data that's going back should be consistent with time always moving forward in terms of the diagram always moving from left to right. Um, and so the cool thing about this is that if things are linearizable and they're always moving forward in time, then you can't have this phenomenon where you're getting a stale read. And so if you're doing, for example, a leader election, um, then if the new leader is node five, then you can't have it where somebody says, who's the leader and they get an old value. And it says the old value is, is node one. Um, and the author talks about that. You can also use this uh, to implement locks so if somebody wants a lock, however you implement it, you know, uh, but basically if you have this one particular resource and you say, you know, I want the lock, then basically once you get it, then um, nobody else can do a read that says, hey, this lock's available. They're all gonna say, you got it. Um, also talks about unique constraints throughout this chapter. So for example, people signing up for a username, only one person can have a particular username. Apparently Vibu can have two different meetup accounts with with the same email address, but under normal circumstances, you can only have one for, for a given username, for a given email address, right? Um, and so the idea is that system is supposed to prevent this. And even if you get two requests simultaneously, it's supposed to prevent it. Um, and then he even talks about cross-channel timing dependencies. So you might have different systems uh, doing things. And there's a diagram in the book where they talk about, gosh, I don't remember exactly what the example is, but basically you've got, the data flowing through one channel and then you've got like a, 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 um, another system that's keeping track of things. And so it's hard to coordinate. Um, so whether you have, you know, in the in his soccer World Cup example, you've got two people talking and that's the side channel um, or you could have two separate systems. Um, and, and, you know, you can keep coming up with different examples if you send out an email in one system, but you're also tracking, you know, the, the username in another system, you can have these um, sort of race conditions. So linearizability helps, helps solve that problem. And so then we get into, well, if this is a good thing, then how are we gonna actually get implement this thing, right? So um, what can, can't you do? So if you have single leader replication, you can potentially do linearizability. Um, he mentions if you use snapshot isolation, then you're breaking things. If you do asynchronous writes, then you can have stale reads uh, from replicas. So, um, so, so you, can, you can't do that. <laughs> you have to have synchronous writes. Um, and then in addition to that, the real problem with, with um, linearizability is what do you do when your leader fails? Okay, the leader does a great job of basically single, you know, ordering all the writes, um, but what do you do when the leader fails? So then you need to have a leader failover process that's satisfactory, that doesn't break linearize, linearizability. Um, mentions that consensus algorithms, yes, can, are linearizable. Multi-leader replication basically can never be linearizable um, because you have concurrent rights. And so any, 
possibility of, of right conflicts and conflict resolution is a completely different model from linearizability. And then he kind of says like, hey, with, with leaderless replication, um, technically it's not impossible, but it's probably not linearizable. Um, and so you have to have strict quorums. You can't do sloppy quorums, definitely. Um, and then uh, basically he says, if you really, really want to do it, so if you have a Dynamo database, you could do synchronous read repair. Um, and then you also can, would have to enforce basically that you do a read from quorum before you do every write. Um, so what all this, the implications of all this basically is that it's going to be very costly um, trying to trying to do linearizability in any of these systems, either the Dynamo example or, or whatever. And so since one of the main use cases, I mean, for, for um, distributed systems is sort of like this today is sort of this global footprint. So you have multiple data centers. You have an Asia data center, a Europe data center, North America data center, whatever, stuff like that, Australia data center. Um, and so if you have replication happening between two data centers, clearly you have a problem because you have a slow connection between these data centers that are very geographically diverse. Um, and if that connection goes down between the two, two data centers, then the guarantee of linearizability um, is that uh, you basically, you can't have stale data that sneaks its way in. And so ultimately what it means is that if you have a leader in North America and you, you get disconnected from, from data center in Asia, then basically you can't process requests in Asia. So it's, it's a really big deal. All right, just checking the chat for a second. I always have to like click this multiple times to get the chat window to pop up. Ryan, is there anything? No, I don't think so. Stephen right. was just saying he's dropping off early. Okay. Um, thanks. So, um, so like like I sort of previewed, you know, this idea of linearizability, it's it's kind of cool. It's somewhat intuitive um, that you can just sort of order things to keep them logical in in sort of time order if you had this global sense of time. Um, but it ends up being super costly uh, to, to try to do this. Um, they mentioned CAP theorem. And it's funny, I remember seeing CAP theorem stuff mentioned in product literature. Um, the author does not seem to think CAP theorem is particularly helpful. <laughs> so I don't know if more recently people have stopped talking about it, but I certainly remember in the past people talking about designing different systems and you know our database and you know we do it this way and because of cap theorem blah blah blah, blah. well um, it made a, it made a lot of difference in back in the early uh, mid 90s and late 90s and early 2000 because you didn't have a lot of database choices right <laughs> now you got redis you've got how many different databases that can you have that are in memory that are available today that can do stuff that oracle can't so <laughs> mm -hmm. There's yep. got a lot, but there's a lot more design features. The replication, yeah. you know, data center replication is handled totally different now than it was 10 years ago and even more different than it was 20 years ago. So, yeah, and it's interesting because like, I mean, after reading this chapter, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of curious if we can, if we have time for a little discussion at the end, just whether or not people think it's it's worth it to try and, you know, get any of these benefits or if you just go for a, a sort of, you know, leaderless potential right conflict kind of universe. I mean, there, there's a few key things that you don't want conflicts on, but, you know, if it's just whatever people posting comments to your, you know, your, your, your Facebook status, like, do you really care if there's a slight, you know, right conflict on or the ordering isn't accurate or, you know, I mean, even if worst case scenario, I see a comment and then it disappears upon refresh or I see a reply to a comment, but the comment itself isn't there yet. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, right? Like that's not really yeah. the end of the world. Well, that goes back to what systems require that data reference integrity to be intact, right? 
if it's a medical record, that's pretty darn important. <laughs> it's a financial transaction, it's very important, right? But mm -hmm. you know, uh, most other yeah. stuff can wait. Right. You know. Yeah, but I, I also wonder, like, to what extent do you really need these guarantees, right? Like, how often is a doctor in Asia simultaneously updating the chart on a patient as a doctor in North America? Right. Well, that's where you're going to get it and where you're going to see the, the place you're going to see it in the medical record community is if it's uh, somebody's doing a distributed um, evaluation. So they're doing a genome sequence to look at that. And that's being done in a data center that is overseas versus here, because that's mm -hmm. where the data is. All right. That 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 you may get some delays in that. But real time medical record stuff, real time is all going to be local. Cool. Thanks, John. Maybe in tw another 20 years when medical records are clearly encapsulated on our watches, then we might have an update issue. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, think, I, I think the financial example is kind of interesting because we've been doing that for a very long time. And you would think that the, the systems are a bit more robust and developed and they're they're kind of looking at it and saying okay we have to put some serious constraints on this and it's going to hurt our performance and all of these other things in order to make it actually work like we would expect basically um, and some of this stuff is relatively new improvements that have been placed on top of these systems yeah yeah that makes sense um i thought it was pretty cool uh th this note here so you know, pretty much every computer you buy today has multiple cores and uh, the model for RAM, even that isn't linearizable because the caches don't synchronize. Um, and so uh, you don't know if, if you write something on one core, uh, whether or not the, the other cores, if they're trying to read that same memory, whether or not they're gonna have a stale value in one of their caches. Level one, well, level current two processor design, the cores can't read each other's caches. That's right. So that's what I'm saying. So that it's not linearizable. You actually can have stale reads on another core. Um, they do not do a process where they void values on other cores' caches. So when you do a write to your cache, you just write it locally and you just assume that the other cores are not trying to read the same value that you just wrote in that moment. Well, it moves up in, in that case, in, in, well, at least with the Intel processor, if you're writing to your level one, it gets replicated to level two, level three, level four, and ultimately to memory. Right. So, but that takes, that takes time. So just the, the author's point is that even RAM is not linearizable. <laughs> and yeah. so uh, uh, that doesn't seem to, you know, that doesn't seem to really end the world, right? Like it's not linearizable and we, we, we're able to live. And so perhaps with a lot of your database, your distributed applications, you could live with this as well, uh, a certain amount of this, you know, certain assumptions. Again, your bank account, you're probably going to have to do tighter, you know, things to make sure that you don't have any weird stuff happening. But um, most use cases, maybe... Maybe you can't live with it. Well, with R in Python, everything you do is sequential unless you demand parallelization explicitly. The parallelization is set up in such way that you do it on different subsets, at least what I've seen. Yep. Yeah, and so actually just to take that example, so if you then uh, take some large calculation that you want to distribute across multiple nodes, you, what, you, what you would hope for is that there's layers of abstraction that have simplified things for you so that you don't actually have to worry about the possibility of a stale read on one of your nodes, right? You'd like your file system or your database or your whatever to abstract some of these things you know, away. Um, I don't really know, like, like the stuff that I've done, a um, little bit I've done on Spark, generally speaking, the data, like the training data for a model at the time that we're training is read only. 
so so there's not really an issue of oh my gosh is it, am i getting something stale or not or whatever because at that point it's basically read only all the nodes are just partitioning it reading it and, and so you're not worried about like is somebody possibly seeing a different value for training example you know 100 than than, than somebody else but but ultimately these are the kinds of issues you do need to, to deal with anytime you're trying to build anything and you're you know you're talking to all these these different nodes as far as i know as far as i could see it can happen the problem may come come up when you uh, duplicate the data yes if, if you duplicate it and then you start doing writes somebody's going to have to you know manage this right yeah good um so so then we move on from uh, linearizability to topics about ordering. So we're going to talk about ordering guarantee, sequence numbers, and ultimately get to a, a, a total ordering. And so the first concept within ordering is just causal consistency. So the idea is that um, if you have events that are not concurrent, so I read a value from A and it says it's one. I add 10 to it and I write it to B. And so B is 11. There is a causal connection between my read of A and my write of B because B should be 10 more than what A was. Um, if you have a stale read and, um, and A is zero, then B is going to be 10, even though it should have been 11. So that's the kind of problems that you can have. And so the author goes and talks about a causal order is a partial order. So anytime you have specific events that are non-concurrent, um, whether you have a proved causal dependency or not gets kind of hairy, but, but basically um, you have events that don't overlap, um, then that imposes an ordering that one must happen before the other. When you have concurrent um, events, concurrent reads, concurrent writes, then uh, causality does not, uh, there's ambiguity. So causality does not impose an order. So it's not a total order. Uh, some items have to be before others, but others it's ambiguous and potentially could be in, in either order. So linearizability is stronger. Um, it ensures a causal order and actually then some. So it does, uh, it does preserve causality. So that's again, where as an application developer, you just don't have these weird things where things seem to be going backwards in time. Um, so they also mentions, and this book remember is like about three ish years old, right? So that there's research into providing um, uh, causal consistency without going all the way to linearizability. And so one possibility is you take the version vectors that we talked about and version vectors, the vectors are per key. Now, in my example of you read A and you write B, now you've actually got two different keys and you need to actually be tracking causality across all of that. It sounds very expensive to me, but. Um, yeah, but well, there's always a price to pay to keep things in sync. Yeah, and, and the hardest part is how do you know sort of the minimum causal connection? So let's say I didn't just read A. Let's say I read 100,000 rows and I wrote B based on the value of one of those rows. How do you know the causal connection, the dependencies only on that one particular row and not on all? Maybe it's the sum. So maybe it's dependent on all 100,000 or whatever. But it, it just seems to me like this could get really expensive fast. Well, it, it can. I mean, there's some coding techniques that evaluate that on that case where you did a select statement, you're selecting data from a bunch of rows, that you, if there's a follow on statement that basically says, did anything change while I was doing that transaction? If something changed, then you trigger in your code that you go back and reread it because something changed while you're doing the transaction. And, you know, that's, I've had to, I had to deal with that years ago um, in Java. <laughs> it was pretty easy to do. It just, it, you had a, kept track of you basically kept track of the queue as to what's going on in parallel with your your workload being done and if something if there was an update that occurred in the log then you had to go back and do it again some you run into problems because sometimes if you did a query like that 
you fire it off and you may have to go back there two or three times to get a good query. Yep. But at least but, you're, you're per, whatever, protecting the user or the, 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 the further layers from having to deal with all the, the weird possibilities. Yeah, I think that in that one application, there was somewhat sensitive data. And after the third pass, we basically came back to the user saying, hey, come back, try it later. <laughs> Too many people are using the data, you know, because it's a, it's a problem. It's a real issue. Yeah, no, yeah. a number of years ago, um, applications that we built uh, using the Microsoft stack, we used to use optimistic concurrency control in SQL Server. And so SQL Server used to uh, support this atomic compare and set operation. Yeah. So, so if we're doing uh, just just basic, um, you know, uh, you know, CRUD type applications, and so you basically, you know, pull up one record, uh, you can modify it, you can, you know, you can insert a new record or whatever. So when you were doing an update, basically we would read uh, SQL Server had this monotonically increasing sequence number that it would attach to every every row, and so when you when you pull up the screen, it would read that. And basically, when you went to do your update, when you went to do your write, you would pass in the, the value that you had, um, and it would do this atomic uh, compare and set. And so basically, it would return an error to you if that, if that value had uh, been changed in the meantime while, while, you were, while you were before the update happened. Um, and if that's the case, then basically what you do is you just do a, a read. You refresh it so that you get the latest writes from anybody else and then you leave it up to the user to actually decide what they're going to do, and then then they can go and they can submit again. Um, and I believe I don't know exactly why, but I believe as Microsoft was trying to uh, move on their eventual path towards Azure and distributed systems, um, that they just uh, had difficulty supporting this monotonically increasing uh, sequence number on on all records. And, uh, and so that's why uh, they, they uh, discontinued support for optimistic concurrency control. So they got rid of the atomic compare and set. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, but it was really nice. I um, mean, we, you know, we were not building applications that were, you know, Facebooks, right? We were building applications for hundreds, maybe thousands of users. And so it was, it was generally speaking fine um, to do things that way. Okay, so then going a little bit deeper into the sequencing, um, basically they say you can have this logical sequence number. So again, you, you just have this counter that's auto incrementing. Uh, it's monotonically increasing. Um, and if you try to figure out ways to do it, you know, if you have like a single node, that's fine. Then again, the problem is what happens when you have a leader failure. Um, so it turns out there is a solution, um, these Lamport timestamps. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of them. I, I hadn't ever used Lamport timestamps. I thought they actually were pretty cool. Um, and so simply by pairing um, this monotonically increasing counter with a node ID, um, you can actually implement this algorithm where the only tweak is instead of just having a counter on each node, what you have to do is anytime you do an operation, if you see a counter that's higher than where you are, you have to bump up your counter to be um, at least as high as, as what you've seen. So this activity happens on every node. So when they get requests from clients, and this activity also happens on clients whenever they see anything from any node. And so this basically, from a causality perspective, anytime you have communication between any two, make sure that the counters are always moving forward. You can never have a lower counter number used after a higher counter was used. So pretty clever. Um, I actually like this, this Lamport timestamp business. And so then, you know, the author goes and pulls the rug out from underneath me after I've just decided that Lamport timestamps are cool and says, but unfortunately, Lamport timestamps are good enough to really help you solve your problems. So thank you for taking the time to learn about them and you're not gonna use them. Um, <laughs> So, um, so the, 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 the issue with the, with the land, Lamport timestamps is that uh, the example he gives is if you're trying to do a unique constraint, okay? 
um, the Lamport timestamp gives you a total order. So at first blush, it looks like it's good enough. The problem is when the total order is known. The total order is known after the fact, after all the requests have come in. In order to implement a unique constraint, say on username, you need to know in the moment that a user is requesting a particular username, you need to know in that moment uh, whether or not you can accept it or not. And uh, with the Lamport timestamps, the ordering happens sort of after the last request has come in for a particular key. It doesn't happen in real time. So we kind of have a problem. So then what do we do? We move on to the next idea, which is the total order broadcast. Um, and so the, the idea here is that if I'm gonna send something out to all the nodes, if it gets delivered to one node, then it's gotta get delivered to every single node. And the ordering on every single node um, has to be the same. Now this can take a long time. So if the node goes down, it's disconnected. This doesn't need to happen right away. It can happen after it reconnects. But what's critical is that you keep retrying forever um, so that the delivery eventually happens. And that when the delivery does happen, that the nodes are able to, to construct the messages so that yes, they are in the correct order. So it turns out that if you have a total order broadcast, um, you can use it to implement linearizability. So then they show sort of um, how you do it. You have a write case and then you have a read case, okay? Um, so the way that you could, you know, do handle the writes is that you have this particular log um, that you, that you, um, you append to and you say, okay, I'm about to do a write for key number one, two, three, four, five. And then you just do a read and you keep doing reads until you see that your one, two, three, four, five um, has actually appeared there. Um, and so if you do that, because the sequence is guaranteed, then you can just simply look and say, okay, well, did anybody try to, read, to write one, two, three, four, five before I did? And if nobody did, then you're, you're good. And if not, then you have to deal with the fact that they won, you might need to reread the value based on what, what, what they did. That's not quite enough because that just, that handles linearizable writes. Then you also need to deal with linearizable reads. And so he mentions three, three options and these are um, not the most attractive options, but, but there are three options. Um, so one is you, you do a similar things to the right where basically you append something to the log that's just a, basically a time marker. Uh, you're not actually trying to change any value. And then you just, again, you keep reading and, and you wait until you see that thing come up and then you know, okay, um, at this point, um, I'm sort of caught up on time and then I can do a read. Um, if a system sort of lets you just sort of peek and say, where is the current position, then you don't have to do that append. You can just wait until you see that you are caught up. Um, or another option is if you have uh, synchronous uh, writes, if you have one replica with synchronous writes, then if you go to the, the replica with synchronous writes, then you're safe to read from it because you can't have any delays. You can't have any stale reads there. Interestingly enough, you can do the vice versa. If you have a linearizable storage, you can actually use that to implement a total order broadcast. That's fairly straightforward in the sense that you just assume you have this register um, um, and, it, and you can use an operation like you know, atomic um, compare and set like I was talking about or atomic increment and get. Um, and so basically all you do is you increment the register and you get the new value. And, and when you have that value, that can be used as your sequence number. And so as long as, as you have linearizability on that register, then you basically guarantee sort of that nice sequencing monotonicity of, of the, the values. And so when you send out your messages, if you use that as the ordering number, even if the physical messages arrive in a different order, the recipient of the recipient node can always uh, say, I'm only going to apply these in sequential order. So finally, the author says, hey, if you have a total order broadcast, if you have this linearizable register, um, then these are equivalent to consensus. And what we really want um, is consensus. So actually, we've had a little bit of, let, let me just pause here <laughs> and see 
if people are with me, if they have comments, uh, people are lost. Any comments? To me, it seems, yeah, it like, seems like, like such a large cost in order to, to guarantee linear, linearizability on read. It just seems yeah. you have to, like, if you want to confirm that everything is consistent across all of the nodes, you have to basically force a read across everything, it seems like. Yeah, I, I kind of, uh, again, I mean, I, you know, maybe we wait till we get to the very end of the chapter. We're, we're getting close. But um, I kind of got left with, I don't know, like, you know, we, we, we've talked about these fancy algorithms for for doing certain abstractions and guarantees, but maybe in the end, it's just not worth it. You know, okay, like so I said. <laughs> let's be realistic. It's good to know this stuff, but the reality is you're gonna choose an architecture that's gonna run behind the scenes. that's gonna meet your need for um, validation for the individual data, right? You're not gonna choose a database that is gonna give you a possibility of having a, a um, a bad value on a read on a multiple update, right? You're not going to choose an architecture that's going to cause your front end to cause a problem uh, with data integrity issues. So um, matching the back end to what the application needs to be is probably the most important step anyway. Because um, I, I mean, going through all this stuff, I go back to my CICS days way back when, um, the operating system was very specific if somebody was you know, going after data, data sets at the hospital that I worked at, if somebody was updating medical records and somebody else was reading that medical record, if somebody was updating the person trying to read the data would get notification that somebody else is writing. So they have to wait till the data gets written before they can see it. Um, that was, that's been around since the seventies, <laughs> you know, but that was the database informing the users and the community that this data is being updated. You can't touch it. You, won't, you can't see it until it's done. Um, so you're going to choose a back end that's going to do that data protection for you. Mm -hmm. um, but in a, a MySQL, the scalable MySQL that I deployed back in 2005, we had 700 nodes of that database and when data was getting updated at one end it took a it took a half second to get through all the other replicas um you know but when that data was up when those slices were being updated we had tags in the database saying that the reads of this area is blocked until the updates are completed so we took steps to account for the time difference of data that takes to takes to write. So if somebody was querying the data that was being updated, their queries were put on hold and they were notified that the queries were put on hold until the updates were complete. So again, that's a different back end, different timing. So I'm assuming those nodes, John, were, were all in the same data center. Uh, well, initially, yes. <laughs> Final deployment, we had two, two data centers, a thousand nodes each across the country. Um, and we were doing, we would update, um, the Eastern data center was updating three hours before our data centers were doing the updates, but it, they, we were continually crawling data. So there were slices being updated continuously in production. So we still had to contend with, you know, periodically somebody would issue a query that would hit a slice that was being updated. Mm -hmm. um, the CIA was kind of notorious for doing shit like that because they wanted to know what was going on in the Middle East continuously. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, definitely use case dependent. And again, I mean, when I think about a lot of the applications today that require sort of that highest level of concurrency, your Twitters, your Facebooks, you know, I, I just don't know that you you need, you know, the same level of accuracy as if it's a medical record or it's Wells Fargo Bank or you know something like that. Yeah, they don't give a shit about referential integrity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, they're deleting half the population right now. So hey, what the hell? <laughs> uh. All right. So uh, moving on, we're we're getting close. Um, 
So we're now talking about distributed transactions. We're not quite at consensus, uh, but it brings up two-phase commit. So two-phase commits been around for whatever, 30 years. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty well-established uh, protocol and and you can do uh, well. I'm getting a little bit ahead, but but basically, you know, you can do it um, between different systems because because there um, it has been um, implemented as a as a vendor agnostic, you know, s system independent, you know, protocol that you can follow. So, what is two phase commit? Uh, basically, uh, um, the author goes through a lot of different pages and goes through like sort of builds up to this, but. But the way I would summarize it, uh, pretty straightforward, is you have to have a separate coordinator, okay? And um, one of the things that was not completely clear in, um, I didn't think was uh, completely clear in the description in the book, is that when you talk about two-phase commit, you're talking about all of the, um, the relevant node systems in a particular transaction. It doesn't necessarily need to be all of the nodes in the system. When you talk about something like uh, synchronizing rights across all uh, replicas in replication, then you're talking about all nodes. Uh, but most of the time in applications doing two-phase commit, it's actually a, a, a more limited number of actors that are involved in the transaction. Um, so you have the coordinator and basically what happens is the coordinator sends a prepare to all, all the participants and it waits for a confirmation. And it needs to get a confirmation from every single node to continue. If it doesn't get one, if it times out, then at that point, it sends out an abort. Um, once it gets a confirmation from every node, that's those nodes saying, if you tell me to commit, I guarantee you that I will be able to commit. So I don't know exactly how that's implemented, but basically I've checked I have enough memory, I have enough space on the disk, I have whatever, 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 I, I, I will be able to, to do this. Um, so some of the databases I've seen and worked with, that two-phase commit starts with a replication of the log, the transaction log, right? So the, it'll write to the transaction log first because that'll go in the first level, the first level cache, and then once the data, the remote nodes re acknowledge that stuff's written to the log, they're going to value any new queries goes across the log before it goes to the data set anyway. So you can actually write the data post transaction five minutes up to five minutes later right so the only thing that mattered was the confirmation the data got into the the write logs yeah um, so, so so maybe maybe you 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 write to the right log in such a way that there's actually a spot for whether or not this transaction was committed and it's a placeholder it's blank but so at least you know you have physical disk space because i've i've you know had transaction logs that were full and couldn't grow and so if you can't, if you can't write that commit, then you can't promise for sure, for sure that you're going to um, commit that transaction. Yeah, ZFS, so gets somehow... very, ZFS gets very interesting the way they do it. That's why they refer to it as they do the transaction logs into the ZIL um, and everything operates from the ZIL back out to the public. So things can hang out and wait. And if there turns out to be a, a, a storage issue, then it, it throws other alarms. <laughs> But that, but but you know, anyway, that's the idea: is that all the nodes that say I'm confirming your prepare, they're saying I guarantee that even if I crash, um, that that when I resume, that eventually um, I will commit this. Yeah, that's so, why it's like it's nice writing to having that write log. That's a the, the, a permanent write write log because then mm -hmm. no matter what happens everywhere else, you can you can catch up. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so when the coordinator hears from everybody, the coordinator writes to its um, log, it writes its commit record. And so now it knows that it has committed this transaction. At that point, it then sends the commit decision to each one of the nodes, and it must retry forever um, to tell those nodes. So if the node goes down, gets disconnected, you just continue to retry. And then at some point, when you have connectivity, when the node's live, you will say, hey, my decision on this was commit. And um, because the node has, has guaranteed that when it hears the commit, it will be able to do so. Um, so doesn't matter how many crashes, how much time lapses, 
like John said, you've got that right ahead log, it gets the commit, it says, okay, fine, I'm doing it. And so uh, because it has that guarantee part in it, that's how uh, you, you can guarantee basically that all the participants um, will uh, uh, have, um, in, they will all either commit or they will all abort when the, when the coordinator tells them to do so. So if you go through and you think about it, the node failures are fairly easy to handle. Most of the time you get node failures fairly early on, the coordinator simply says, hey, I can't commit this, everybody abort, okay? Um, but even if later on a particular node fails, basically it's just a case where the coordinator is gonna retry, 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 retry. And eventually when it gets uh, in communication with the node, then finally that node will, will commit. The problem is, if you get a coordinator that fails after it sent out the prepare, but before it has committed, then all the nodes are left in limbo. Okay, they've, um, they've, they've, as John mentioned, they've written to their logs. They're, they're they're all ready to see if they get an explicit abort, then they can they can undo the transaction. If they get the commit, they can they can commit it. But if the coordinator dies, then they're just they're just left hanging. You know, that's where you got to figure out whether the uh, quorum feature is active and working. <laughs> yeah. So the author mentions the possibility of a three-phase commit, but doesn't seem really realistic to me because you have to have bounded delays and bounded response times from nodes, and we can't really guarantee those. Um, so, um, you know, the other kind of talks about, well, if you have a database internal thing, then things are a little bit easier because you're all in the same software, but if you have a heterogeneous system, so this is where um, XA transactions comes, comes in, um, then, then basically you have this lowest common denominator phenomenon where, where you have to just basically say, this is the minimum you have to do to support distributed transaction um, processing. Um, so list um, some different things and doesn't go into detail, but basically the idea is that if things go wrong in just exactly the, the wrong way, uh, you, you can actually have a coordinator where um, we talked about that failure mode where it left the notes hanging. Even when the coordinator comes back up, what's supposed to happen is it's supposed to look at the logs and it's say, oh, uh, I did this commit, but I never told all the nodes, never got confirmation from them that they all, you know, succeeded in doing the commit. So let me re resend out those messages. And then the nodes would be like, okay, fine. Um, and, and so you can get these orphan transactions. And the problem with an orphan transaction is it's not a temporary thing. Um, nothing will ever undo the orphan transaction. Um, it will it will sit there uh, forever because all of these systems, the coordinator and the nodes, have all said, "I've written all this to durable storage so that I can implement commits." And so, because they've written it to durable storage, it's never going to go away. Um, and so, in in a real system, if you are if you are about to write to key one two three four five, what that means essentially is that you're gonna you're gonna grab a write lock. On one two three four five, and that means that no, basically nobody else can touch one two three four five, um, and so this is going to be this is going to be a problem if you have too many of these uh, uh, transactions that are either in limbo waiting for the coordinator, or worse yet, if you have orphan transactions, uh, in which case um, you're just kind of up the creek. So. Um, so the distributed transactions do serve a purpose and they definitely can have something where, for example, you have a message queue. And so you want to have a single atomic transaction that says recipient system has processed whatever that message was and message queue is then going to um, acknowledge that the message was received. You want those two things uh, to be atomic. You don't want either either you know way. You don't want the, the, the message queue to say the message was processed when the other system didn't. 
and you also don't want the, mess the, the, the recipient to process it, but have the message queue think that it wasn't, in which case then maybe it might ask you to process it a second time, or it might, you know, uh, in some way, you know, send back an error message. So, so that's, that's kind of the use case for these atomic transactions. So then ultimately, what we want, what we've been trying to get to this whole chapter is consensus. And so the model of consensus is where a node or multiple nodes um, can propose values. Um, and what has to happen is this set of criteria here, okay? So we want uniform agreement, which means that a decision gets made and every single node agrees on the decision. The integrity part is that not only do they agree, but really can only decide once. And so this makes sure that you, you you, you don't have, um, you know, it's item potency. So, so you, you don't possibly have side effects that are repeating. All right, hold on one second, guys. All right. Um, uh, validity, uh, you know, technically you need this, uh, it's, you know, uh, and, and then termination. So these two just make sure that you actually make progress on, on real um, answers. Uh, you can't just say, uh, you know, null, fail on every single thing. That's not actually a useful form of con con consensus. And so in particular, um, if you look at the two-phase commit, it does not meet the termination requirement of consensus. So having described all of these things that are not quite consensus, the author now says, consensus is really hard and it's so complicated. I don't really have room in this chapter to talk about it, but here's some systems that actually implement consensus. <laughs> it's like, wow, look at that. Um, and then they do explain that, um, um, generally speaking, what, um, how they're gonna implement it is using a total ordered broadcast and what they're going to do is this epoch numbering business. So kind of, you know, found it to be a little bit reminiscent of uh, the Lamport timestamps. Uh, but basically what it says is that the epochs are monotonically increasing. And so say you're doing leader election, um, that basically there will only be one leader uh, per, per epoch. And if you imagine a split brain scenario where um, old leader says, hey, wait a second. Um, I'm trying to do a write on key one, two, three, four. And, and I'm the leader, so you all should listen to me. And then you've got the new leader that says, no, 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 no. Old leader, we, we declared old leader dead. And so um, somebody else told me they want to write to key one, two, three, four. You should believe me. Well, in that split brain scenario, how do you know which leader you're supposed to listen to? So the idea is that because they have these epochs, when they do a new leader election, new leader has a higher epoch number than old leader. And so that's why you can always immediately tell uh, which, uh, which is the new, which is the old. And, uh, and upon hearing that, that new leader has a higher epoch number, basically what has to happen is old leader has to resign. Say, oh, okay, I didn't know about this. I didn't know you guys all thought I was dead, but apparently you did, and so therefore, I'm resigning, I'm gonna to listen to new leader. So um, a few limitations that are noted, I think these are, these are uh, somewhat important. So the leader, uh, the author makes an analogy that sort of this voting process is a lot like synchronous replication in the sense that you need to be able to hear from um, you know all these other nodes, and you have to get a quorum in order in order to be able to proceed. Also, if you since you require a majority for consensus, if you have network partition, then clearly the minority nodes that are partitioned out, they're not going to be able to do any work uh, because they're not going to be able to get any and uh, a, a consensus. That's probably what you expect. The whole notion of consensus. Um, this is how you avoid right conflicts. Uh, but again, 
for Twitter, maybe you just don't need that level of data integrity. Maybe you just say, screw it. I'm, I'm more interested in availability. Thought it was interesting that the consensus algorithms don't allow you to add or remove nodes. Uh, so, so you still have issues um, if your say application is growing over time or whatever, at some point you may need to just stop the whole thing and like restart consensus with a different set of nodes if that's what you really need to do. Um, and then there's some weird edge cases. Um, so if you have a large network delay, then then this can really if you if you are timing out leaders, then this can cause a lot of elections. And then you you may be wasting resources, not getting real work done. You're just spending a lot of time doing elections. And um, and also even they found stuff where like you've got one slow node, one, one slow network link, and you get in this weird mode where where the leader's bouncing back and forth between two of them because something keeps timing out and they can't get a quorum, stuff like that. So um, not 100% foolproof, but apparently this is this is as good as we're going to get right now. So then he talks about um, Zookeeper and some of the different services uh, that they provide. I don't think I'm going to necessarily, you know, go through um, all of these, but for me, sort of the takeaway is because there's still this cost for consensus. Typically, what you're going to do is you're going to run consensus on a smaller number of nodes. So here it says, you know, if you've got a thousand nodes, you're not going to run consensus on all of them. What you're going to do is you're going to have, say, maybe five that handle all the coordination. And then the other nodes just need to know that not all nodes are equal, that they need to talk to one of these other nodes. And you can even do this thing, which is, where is it? Uh, um, um, um. Um, this this read-only caching. So you can even have more than five nodes that have the results of all of the, the decisions. Um, but these other ones, they don't participate in the voting. So they don't slow the voting down. Um, it's just they get a, they get a read-only copy of all the decisions. And so then you can have a, a, a more highly scalable, highly available way of reading all the results of the decisions, such as you know who's the leader now, something like that. Um, and so typically what you're gonna do is you're gonna have a fairly small number of things like system configurations, like who's the leader, you know, what IP address is, is such and such happening, these very you know, key um, um, pieces of information, um, small amounts of information that you run through something like Zookeeper. Um, and it's basically the bare minimum, whatever you, know, you need um, this kind of information you use Zookeeper, otherwise, if you don't need that level, then, then you don't have to worry about consensus. And you just have your main database, your main system, you know, working however it works. And, and there's a few things that you can offload to it. Um, and so one of the things you can do is like just a, a, a true membership um, service where it just basically tells you here are all the nodes currently participating. Um, and then one of the things that I thought was pretty cool is that I don't remember where, oh, here it is. Um, Zookeeper. Uh, does also have uh, where you can subscribe to notifications. So you can say, oh, this particular uh, record stores who the leader is. I want you to notify me anytime this changes. So you don't have to keep polling. You don't have to keep asking, who's the leader? Who's the leader? Who's the leader? Who's the leader? Um, and waste resources doing that. So it's not like every time you need to do something, you need to ask who's the leader. But you can just simply say, tell me if this particular setting changes. And then Zookeeper will say, hey, you know what? I want you to know that there's new value in here. And so then you know there's a new leader. All right, so that's, that's my tour through, um, like I said, this, this chapter for me was definitely the, the most abstract, the, the, the heaviest. Um, I definitely have much more respect for the difficulty in building these distributed systems. Um, and, uh, and like I mentioned back when we talked about transactions, uh, I definitely thought that 
some of the applications that I built using just just single database, single node um, transactions. Um, I thought that you know the guarantees were stronger than what I actually had, and so we probably just lucked out that we didn't run into too many edge cases. But because we were not running like full, you know, serializable transactions, um, we we actually had you know like right skew that could have hit us, but I guess for the most part we just got got lucky and we never did. So anybody else? Any any other thoughts, questions? I've I've definitely learned a whole lot. I still don't know if I've developed really this sort of practical hands-on experience from all of the stuff we've learned so far to to necessarily say okay here are my requirements i think i'm going to scale this big i think i need this amount of availability and consistency and, and all of that stuff to necessarily be able to sort of spec out a system exactly like like i want because we've kind of discussed everything kind of haphazardly but i don't know specifically i want this this and this so I should go for this set of tooling, basically. I think that that would be kind of an interesting side thing to explore eventually. Uh, I can tell you that um, my current project with Saiba, every time I turn around, I come across a new project that's doing something different with uh, messaging. And while I've been focused on MQTT for the better part of the last three years, there's some other technologies like, um, what is it, uh, CAFTA, Apache CAFTA, that's doing messaging as well, that uh, and, and adds some syntax on top of the messaging that seems like hey, maybe I can take advantage of that, but at the end of the day, I need guaranteed delivery of the messages. So there, every time you turn around, there's always gonna be a new technology that you could, continuously change and chase after, or you bite the bullet, you build it as best you can, and and then six months down the road, you reevaluate, <laughs> which is probably what we're gonna do with, um, when we get funding here. Yeah, like I, I thought it was kind of interesting to see um, the author saying, so maybe you have a replicated database and you're using ZooKeeper, right? Uh, but you're not just using Zookeeper, you're actually using Apache Curator on top of that because even with the services that Zookeeper provides, it can be a little bit tricky implementing, you know, these atomic operations and ephemeral nodes correctly. And so you yeah. need a higher, it's like, holy cow, you know, all I really want is just a distributed database, but you're telling me that I need, I need a database and I need Zookeeper and I need Curator, you know, like just yeah, to well, it's, get it. uh... <laughs> it's who they are right uh, apache's a uh, an interesting project they're constantly reinventing things in hopes to improve what their ultimate goal is which i haven't quite figured that out for all these yeah. years but i mean it just just so for me re-emphasizes that this stuff is tricky so but yeah ryan to your point you know i think that there are key things so like your main data, how much do you care about it, right? If you're Wells Fargo Bank, then probably you're gonna have something that's slower, you know, that's gonna do more sort of synchronous, you know, transaction-y type stuff or whatever, right? If you're Twitter, maybe you don't care as much, but there are certain things the author mentions like signing up for a username. You really don't want two different people to sign up for the same username at once, you know? And there's certain other, you know, key operations that, that you know, you may need. And so I guess, yeah, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a systems guy. I, I couldn't necessarily say this is exactly how to define the requirements, but uh, to definitely have a much deeper appreciation and not just be like, oh, I talked to this vendor, whether it's, you know, Cassandra or, you know, uh, I talked to somebody at AWS and they said Dynamo is fine. <laughs> you know, like, oh, maybe I need to ask a few more questions about these yeah. working cases. I, 
I think so far the the book has done a good job of exposing me to the principles and I at least know the questions to ask. I think it's been good in that regard because I go, okay, I need these various principles and I might fall into this pitfall and I might need this for this kind of data and this other thing for this other kind of data. But I, I think where I'm kind of missing things is they, they throw out a lot of tools. They say Zookeeper and um, all of these other things. And I, I don't know which pieces necessarily go together. I don't know which ones have exactly which characteristics. And I think that I would still need to spend quite a bit of time researching that if I ever tried to actually make something of my own. I think I'm actually educated on the topics, but I still need to kind of look at things if I were to try to make something. Yeah. Keep in mind, there's probably a book on Zookeeper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm sure there, well, just like the CAFTA, um, you know, uh, <laughs> sometimes I yeah. think Apache is all about writing books. And <laughs> take, yeah, or even, take, I don't know how you a, say it. Do people say, um, you know, etsd or et cetera d or et cetera demon? I don't know. Um, but there's probably a book just on like et cetera demon. I've heard etsy. That's, that's why I've heard before. Is that how people say it? It's uh, always funny. When you like look at it and you're like, how am I supposed to say this out loud? That's what I took some Kubernetes courses and they always say Etsy when they when they use the key value store. So I mean maybe they're wrong, but they got everything out in Kubernetes right. So I mean, uh, yeah, but if you've been around uh, Unix and Slayers as long as I have and going back to the nineties, ETC is ETC. <laughs> so do you say ETCD? ETC demon? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't. It's deep. Yeah. I mean, this doesn't have to be one right answer. I was surprised that people yeah, it's... people argue about um about N U M P Y. I mean, I don't really care how you pronounce it, but I thought that was interesting. Uh, yeah, well, that's it. Yeah, there's a lot of them out there that are like that. It's um sci-fi, numpy, pi-pi. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Good job All today, right. by the way. Oh, thanks. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Um,